so I'd like to apologize in advance if I cough during this and blow the speakers. And um, also like to apologize in advance if I come to any of your talks during the next two days and cough all the way through in a really annoying way. Um, welcome. Uh, it's, um, it's always a great privilege each year to have like this many bright people in the room and be allowed to just talk about whatever I want. Um, so, and every year I seem to sort of pick something that's got nothing at all to do with audio. Uh, same again this year, I'm afraid. Next year, definitely promise, promise to do audio. But <clears throat> I was trying to think of what to talk about this year, and um, since I've got this privilege to talk about whatever I want, there's a sort of pressure to talk about something that's important. So being a bit of an over-abstractor, rather than actually thinking of something that's important, I've decided to talk about what is important. Um, now, we've got like a... I'm sure there's a few business people in the room, a few JBs, but most of you guys are, you're the coders, you're the mathematicians, you're the engineers, the people who actually do the, the really clever stuff. Um, and audio, sound, music, the stuff that we all work in, I mean, it's really important, right? It's like, um, it's a really useful, purposeful thing for us to devote our huge talents to, right? I mean, if we all decided to, to go off and do something else and become landscape gardeners or something, the world would be a bit, a bit sadder, a bit emptier without all the things that we build. I mean, that's right, you know, isn't it? <clears throat> I mean, I've worked for a very long time now in audio, and I spent years and years sweating over products and code for other people to build products. And, you know, I like to think some of the stuff I've built is good. I like, like to think some of the things that people have used my libraries for are good. So, you know, that makes my contribution important, right? You know, like to some extent. Um, you know, if I'd gone off and attempted the career at being, uh, a very mediocre guitarist or something, then you know, the world would be worse, worse than it is now in some little way. I, I'd like to think that. So the, the, talk, the talk's called, Does Your Code Actually Matter? Um, a, a obligatory dictionary definition slide. So I threw this up and then I realized it's actually got two meanings, matter, which I, I think was really nice. The second one, um, <clears throat> the talk today is about the first one. Um, I actually thought maybe next year I'll do it to the same title, do the second one. Uh, or, maybe after, or maybe after a few drinks tonight. But um, the, what, I, what I want to blather on about is, like, is what we do in, important? Is the stuff we write significant? And how? So this came out of um, a conversation I had in the pub a while ago. I was chatting to a particularly cynical friend of mine who works with me at Rowley. And you know, d yeah, despite our happy, clappy image, we do have a few uh, cynical employees, just you know, diversity and everything. Um, and he, he was having a bit of a bit of an existential whinge. Oh, you know, oh, what we're we're working on all this stuff and we're working really hard. And it doesn't it doesn't really matter. You know, we're we're building these instruments and yeah, you know, they they funky and they light up and it's fun and people make tunes with them and enjoy it. And um, a list celebrities come along and tell us that we're all cool and it's great. And it's all a lot of fun to be involved with. And the stuff we the problems we have to solve are really fun, challenging things to work on. But you know, we make gadgets and. Gadgets, they end up in people's cupboards collecting dust, and eventually, you know, they, they end up in a landfill somewhere. And, you know, it, it, what's the point of it all? Um, so, you know, I, I said, well, you know, it's fun. It's fun to build them, right? You know, lighten up. You know, we're all going to die one day. Um, the, there's a, a tiny handful of gadgets that are going to end up in a design museum somewhere, but, like, the vast majority are going to end up on, on the scrap heap. You know, anything you build today, it might look beautiful and elegant and amazing, and everyone will go, oh, that's so shiny. But you know that pretty soon it's going to look like a, an embarrassing, clunky old relic. And as developers, we're in a sort of weird point in history, a sort of lucky for us point in history, where society rewards us disproportionately well for doing um, a job that um, we'd probably all be doing anyway, even if nobody paid us to do it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what the average developer salary is. Maybe it's about what a dentist gets, or maybe a low-paid doctor. I don't know. But you know, you're not going to get many dentists doing dentistry in their spare time as a, as a hobby if it wasn't their day job. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> but for us, um, we, we all, we'll find programming such a, a fascinating puzzle challenge to do. Um, but unlike doing a crossword or a Sudoku, you know, people actually pay you to do this stuff. So let's not, let's not rock the boat. <clears throat> yeah, let's enjoy it while we can. I mean, pretty soon one of, one of, the, one of our traitorous programmer colleagues is going to write some sort of AI that can write bug-free code 24 hours a day and 
It, you know, it won't demand an office like this with ping pong, ping pong tables and a barista. But the, this pub conversation kind of left me with a couple of, I went away with a couple of nagging doubts, like A, was my friend really on message enough to work at Rowley? And B, <coughs> what, you know, did he have a point? Are we just wasting our like, massive intellects and all the, all, the, all the talent we've worked out on all, you know, building up all these years on some ephemeral rubbish that it doesn't really matter? So I, did, I wanted to talk about that today as it seemed kind of more important than my previous, the, my second choice topic was gonna be how much I hate my, uh, the user interface on my new microwave oven. I think this would probably be better. So, <clears throat> let's float up into space with the power of our imagination um, and sort of picture the world there with billions of semiconductors and they're all, they're all fizzing and there's trillions of instructions running every second down there. Um, and so buried in this sort of vast sea of activity there's the sort of trails and patterns of um, bits of code that millions of us of writers are pouring into it every day. You know, it's a huge evolving ecosystem of code and people and memes in, in the non-Reddit sense, all sort of fighting for, for survival. And which bits of it are important and like which bits are, which bits are just bits, just ones and zeros and a waste of electrons? <clears throat> in other fields, like if you're, if you're in art or music, you're going to find thousands of academics who will uh, happily come along and, and talk about what's important because that's their entire day job. You know, their, their job is comparing which works of art or music that someone else has written are the significant ones. You know, every university has a whole bunch of courses where students will spend years learning to talk about what makes a particular painting or a tune better than another one. Um, and after you know, all those years of study the, and building up all that student debt, the students leave and they go on to become baristas serving you guys flat whites. And you're, you know, you're the, all the high-tech employees who are building, you know, you've got, you're running careers where you're using at least as much creativity and ingenuity as a lot of those great artists. Um, but you know, normally the only critique that we'll get of our work is um, its net promoter score. And artists and writers, they're, they're a lot more upfront about uh, than we are about wanting to create work that other people are going to consider to be important. I mean, most artists are going to claim that, oh, I'm doing it for myself, for my, own, for my own purposes, but you know that they secretly all dream that one day whatever they've created is going to be rediscovered by the world after they're dead as a great work of genius and be up there again with all their heroes. Um, whereas if your colleague at work told you that he was writing this function for posterity, uh, you know, you'd probably give them a damn good taunting for being pretentious, and quite rightly so. But, you know, maybe we just need a little, little bit more of that attitude. You know, maybe that wouldn't be quite such a bad thing, as long as we don't say it out loud. <laughs> Here's a, an unconvincing stock photograph of some students. Um, you know, maybe these, are, maybe these are future students on a coding criticism course. And, you know, they're, they're sitting around discussing the, the essay they've got to write about my use of lambda functions in my later period. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a silly idea, and it's a nice idea, but um, you know, I, I'd love to see the reactions of art historians if you dumped a course like that on the, in the humanities department. And, and I'm not a humanities lecturer, so although I'm, gonna, I'm sort of attempting here to talk about what makes things important, I'm not gonna kinda do it in a humanities style. I'm gonna try and be a bit quantitative. Um, I do reserve the right to be a bit vague here about what I mean by a piece of code because you know, that obviously that could be anything from an algorithm to uh, a few machine instructions for a particular CPU that does a particular thing. I, I don't know how to be more precise than, about that. Now, in the, um, in the hard sciences, it's a bit more straightforward. Because um, some things are gonna pop to, <coughs> pop to the surface as definitely being significant. You know, relativity, quantum theory, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty damn significant until someone comes along and manages to figure out something underneath them. Um, you know, no one's questioning the importance of evolution. Um, you know, at least not anyone who's actually done a bit of evolving. Um, in maths, it's even more fundamental. Like um, in, for example, number theory, uh, you know, there are universal proofs and principles that people have figured out, which you'd expect not to ever be improved upon. And you'd, where you'd expect you know, any suitably advanced alien civilization would probably come up with the same stuff because it's fundamental. Um, and you know, so we, we, we know that those things are important. But for us, coders, um, stuff isn't quite so clear. Like this little, uh, this bunch of likely dads here, uh, Turing, Girdle, and Church kind of 
help spoil our party by showing how hard it is to, to prove really anything useful at all about um, some of the more interesting algorithms that you might want to run. You know, if you can't even prove whether a piece of code is going is to terminate, then good luck proving that you know, my code is better than yours. <clears throat> and then even when you talk about a particular algorithm, um, you know, you, there are infinitely many ways to write the same thing. Um, and you know, even, even if you get all theoretical and try and talk about only writing for like a, the simplest possible universal computer, whatever that is. Uh, so we're in a kind of no man's land where it's, it's, hard, it's rare to be able to point to a bit of code and mathematically say, like, that's the best way to do that particular task. Um, but like anyone with a bit of experience, I mean, we all, we all know what it's like to be able to, we've all developed a good aesthetic sense of what makes some code good and bad. Um, you know, it, it's a bit like artists, good and bad though, because you know, we, we have opinions and opinions differ. Uh, you know, good, what's, what's good code, bad code, tabs and spaces. But we, we kind of all agree on a lot of the basics, uh, like spaces. Um, <clears throat> so without wanting to get too serious or scientific, I mean, this is just for, just a laugh. But um, I'm going to throw out a few of ideas I had for what kind of qualities uh, a piece of code might have that make it matter. So uh, significant quality number one is that certainly the important stuff sticks around. Um, the longevity of an algorithm um, is definitely got to be an important factor in judging you know, how important this is. Um, and the really fundamental algorithms, like the fundamental math stuff, is likely to keep being reinvented by future societies, aliens, etc. I kind of I imagine that in about a million years, the the, the super intelligent AIs that inhabit our sun's Dyson sphere, um, they're still going to probably be doing the occasional merge sort or a binary chop. You know, even if the intelligences that that arise are pay, become some weird post neural network thing that we can't really speculate about. There's still going to be some low-level housekeeping in there. You know, they're going to they're going to have low-level nuts and bolts code. Um, they might use some kind of cryptographic hashing for their communication across their thing, uh, or graph traversal algorithms. You know, they might have some FFTs running in there just to process signals from their alien space neighbors. Um, it'll all be written in C plus plus two two million and something. Um, and most of the, these kind of fundamental algorithms are ones that got invented pretty early on in the history of computing. Uh, but th there's a few more recent ones, like um, I heard a couple of weeks ago some researchers have come up with um, an improved algorithm for analyzing huge scale data streams and pulling information out of it, like a better, than, be this is a use case that um, didn't really exist until data streams got really big recently. But what they invented is pretty fundamental. So you can imagine that these AIs may, you know, they might still be using that same algorithm that these guys invented for their future version of you know, to, to manage the petabytes of data that the future Facebook is churning out every millisecond. And then when you move up from the fun, really fundamental stuff, then you get to things like um, you know, Unix is a bit of a cockroach of the, of the software world. Um, it'll definitely survive a nuclear bomb blast. Um, and all those command line utilities, they were written decades ago. And it's pretty safe to say they're still going to be running billions of times a day for like plenty more decades to come. I mean, but then once the super intelligent AIs take over, they're probably not going to re reinvent or uh, grep in its current form. They'll, they'll write something better, um, hopefully at least with a better name. Um, one, one question um, I'd really love to know the answer to with these super intelligent life forms is whether they're going to end up doing all their programming in kind of a future super perfect alien Haskell language, um, or whether they just write everything in assembly language because they're clever enough to do that. Um, you know, hopefully look, when, you know, one day, you know, when you, as your consciousness is getting uploaded into the singularity, um, it'd be nasty if, I, if that happens to me and I find they have to write everything in assembly language and they're all uh, using tabs, not spaces or something. Uh, the C language is another good example of a Unix style old technology that's really going nowhere, <coughs> nowhere anytime soon. Um, but C and Unix are kind of, they're both examples of a, of a local maxima. We're kind of stuck on this, this lump. Um, you know, they, they kind of do the job, but there are arg arguably, um, allegedly better languages and better operating system tools that we could build, and which, if we replace them with, with these better things, the world would be a better place. But we kind of have to make, use, we need extra energy to make the jump to a better, other, higher, not quite so local maxima. 
Um, I mean, one day that will happen due to some kind of pressure. Uh, but in the meantime, we can, I, I think in terms of significant points, C, Unix, Windows, you know, they, they win a lot of points for their staying power. MIDI is another great example of a, a local maxima that we're just stranded on. I mean, but with MIDI, I, you know, it's more like it's actually at ground level and the ground around it has fallen away rather than <laughs> it being a local, local lump. <clears throat> so quality number two, um, how often do these things get run? Like, obviously, if something's important, we're going to run it a lot. So I had a quick, quick brainstorm of, like, what might be the most frequently executed things in the world today. Obviously, you've got the really, really low-level things. Two complement, two complement additions. Probably still going to happen in that AI Dyson Sphere thing. Um, CPU microcode, probably not. But um, every Intel chip, every move operation it does, every it's actually running a tiny program. So imagine how many trillions of times a second that stuff's running out there. Um, you know, think about RGB color compositing. Like the screen here, the screen here, all your phones. 60 times a second, they're all running this. RGB compositing um, algorithm that I've written a couple of times myself, and it's an interesting one to do. But like, how many million pixels are being composited with this um, every second just in this room alone? And as you sort of step up in scale, um, you'll get to sort of library code. And apparently, these are the most commonly used libraries. Zlib wins, um, not my rewritten version. Uh, the um, SQLite is apparently another pretty pretty common one. And these things have been baked into millions of other apps. So uh, you know, the numbers of this running is really impossible to imagine. It's a shame, though, that when we get to this kind of library scale, it's like the evolutionary pressures on this code ease off a bit, um, and we start to end up with some incumbents that really could have been replaced by leaner, fitter <coughs> competitors if, if only they'd existed. You know, Zlib's fine, um, but, like, it wasn't hard when I did my talk to, to improve it. Um, you know, libjpeg and ping, they're, they're fine. They kind of do the job, but they're kind of the same level of code as Zlib. SQL likes pretty good, I guess. Um, uh, in in audio world, we've got something like FFmpeg, which, um, whew, I mean, in in the gap of like popularity to quality, that's the the example, the biggest example I've seen of the, the, that that appalling difference. It's it's the go-to library that you you get, you go to, you use if you need to do any audio or video encoding or decoding. But you look inside and it's a, a it's a stinking cesspit of bad practice. Uh, everyone I've ever known who has to use it despises it. But because it's so big and, and it's so hard to replace, it has no competitors. Um, but I mean, even the other ones, like you wouldn't, hopefully none of you, if, if you're, someone on your team wrote libping and, and submitted it for a code review, you wouldn't pass that. I mean, you wouldn't, you'd just throw it back at them and say, come on, you know, do better than that. At least give it some proper variable names. Lay it out, probably. It's like so, but these are like the most popular things that we use. Obviously, if something's important, if if, if you if a no op instruction runs a trillion times, who cares? But so it's got to affect people. Um, it's got to affect people. It's preferably a lot of people. Um, and whereas the RGB compositing here, that function, it runs a lot, and it kind of indirectly affects you because you can see the screen. Um, <clears throat> you get, there are bigger algorithms. Uh, that actually more directly affects a lot of people. Uh, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, all of those, their, their search and um, new discovery algorithms, uh, you know, they, these, these guys are more directly steering the course of history um, for the entire world's population you know, in ways that probably even the authors of those algorithms didn't re didn't, weren't really quite sure of when they wrote them. Um, you know, the, the, the biasing and filtering that they do of news is kind of, it's not, it's, 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 you'd call it a butterfly's wing effect on history, but it's more of a kind of hippo's foot. Um, there's, a, there's a shady data firm called Cambridge Analytica, which allegedly used some data analytics algorithms to um, optimize the Trump and Brexit campaigns. And a lot of people are saying that those, that tipped it over, over, the, over the edge and actually won for those, uh, for those, for those uh, parties. I mean, I don't know what code they were running, and we probably never will, but... That, that gets some significance points, whatever it was, for affecting a lot of people's lives. <clears throat> and obviously, the depth of impact that an algorithm has needs to be taken into account, as well as just the number of people. Um, so airplanes probably have um, a little function that kicks in when two of them are going to crash into each other and makes them go like that. And that's something that probably runs very, very rarely, at least you'd hope so. And when it does run, it's not going to affect the whole world's population very much, but the impact on the people on that plane is going to be pretty huge. 
Um, you've got things like the Stuxnet virus, which was designed to only run on like Iranian um, en nuclear enrichment centrifuge computers, which is pretty specific. Um, but that had a really big impact on a lot of people's lives. Um, vi other viruses obviously have a big impact in the other way, like the, the, uh, the what's it called, the WannaCry vi virus that brought the, the, um, a bunch of hospitals to a standstill over here briefly a few months ago. Um, so th there's a scary amount of code out there that has life and death influence over us. Cancer diagnosis algorithms, life support machines, you know, drug and genetic research systems. They're a big deal. And another, th another <coughs> quality of it, significant code is like what depends on it. Um, the really important stuff you find also tends to be relied on by other really important stuff. So real basics, you know, sorting containers and things, obviously omnipresent in like all software. Um, compilers, virtual machines, these are needed by everything. So these are vast, you know, enormously important things to, to work on. Uh, you know, the libraries like Zlib, they're not quite so universal, but um, they're certainly vital to non-trivial stuff. Um, in fact, I was trying to think of a really important app or a tool that doesn't have any dependencies, and it's kind of hard to think of them. The best I could do would be something like a popular game like, um, that doesn't have any add-on modules, like Candy Crush or Flappy Bird, but I really, it sticks in my throat to call those things important. Um, or something like a, a, a website, a very simple website like Hacker News that has no, no, no dependencies, um, you know, and it doesn't, it, it, nothing, nothing depends on it other than how much time we all waste. So, um, w last significant quality, like, obviously there's lots of ways to implement the same thing, um, to do the same job with different performance characteristics. Um, you'd hope that evolution will favor those that use the least energy because that's what tends to happen in real, real evolution. Um, you know, you could write an algorithm that can calculate the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but if it takes more energy than the universe contains to, to, for it to complete, then who cares? Um, and clearly, a faster source algorithm is just better than um, a less efficient source algorithm because it uses less power and goes quicker. Um, of course, energy efficiency in the real world isn't quite that simple. Um, the fastest implementation, implementations of things tend to be code that we've tweaked and made work on a specific um, uh, architecture. But you know, imagine you, if you imagine you're running on a sort of abstract machine and it, you can ignore all the vectorization and parallelization factors, then the fastest implementation also tends to be quite a good one, quite a clean and canonical one. And canonicality was the sort of word I was scrabbling for here is like, <coughs> If you're writing um, an implementation of a function, how close is it to that perfect canonical form for, that, for, that, um, for what that's trying to do on an abstract machine? Um, because the more canonical something is, the, it feels like the, more, the, the longer it's going to live, the more it's going to be adopted by people. I mean, any decent developer kind of understands this concept uh, it, it, without really having a name for it. Um, it's like you're, you're, you're looking at a piece of code trying to think, oh, you know, what's the perfect form for that? Um, and yeah, better canonicality means better, better energy. Um, the energy footprint is also kind of feeds around into having uh, an impact on people as well. Like um, it's something like a, G a GPS navigation algorithm actually probably saves more energy in shorter car journeys than it takes to run the thing. So that's good, isn't it? Negative, uh, a negative value for it. But there's a few energy use outlier, uh, outlier algorithms out there like a uh, good old Bitcoin and the, the cryptocurrencies where they only exist because they waste energy. Um, and you know, if uh, someone came along and found a dramatically more efficient way to calculate a Bitcoin um, calculation, then you know, they'd probably win a mathematics prize, get very rich, but they'd also bring the entire thing tumbling down because that's wasted. waste is the purpose of that whole thing. Now, don't take this too seriously, but having brainstormed those things, I thought I might as well try and throw them together into an equation. Uh, I'm definitely not a mathematician, so I asked people in the office if this looks like maths. Um, <laughs> so uh, I wanted to create an impressive looking formula. This has got like a lambda and a sigma in it. Um, so that, that must be good. That must, it convinces me anyway. So uh, the significance of your code is equal to its half-life times how many times it gets run times the sum of the impact, the sum of the impact on all the individuals plus the delta of how much it affects the significance of its dependencies, all divided by how much energy it wastes running. You know, very hand wavy, but I thought that was kind of fun. <clears throat> so how can you optimize this? You know, you're writing some code, how can you, how can you 
tweak the, the, the variables in this equation to make your code more significant. So longevity, like um, ima imagine you're given a project at work, like just to pull a, an example out of the air, a portable music controller um, or yet another FM synth. Um, you know, you're hammered with deadlines and uh, the design of the product's already nailed down. So you're just focused on making the damn thing work in time. And you're gonna be churning out code without really much thought about the long-term impact. <coughs> but, you know, if you've developed a good habit of just pausing occasionally, you know, maybe when you're making a coffee or um, sitting in your office ball pit, and you just think a little bit more speculatively about um, like the future incarnations of whatever you're working on, I mean, sure, you, you, don't, you don't really know what they are. You, you, you know that the current design isn't going to last forever, but uh, it'll be superseded. But you, you can kind of imagine, like, what, what kind of things may it turn into? What's going to be co what's it going to have in common with the, the current version? What's definitely not going to be in common? Um, and are there any minor things you could do without too much time or effort now that are going to make your life easier in a year or two when the next generation of this thing comes along and you have to build it? You know, very often you'll find that there are. There are things. Um, and if you make that habit, you'll develop an eye for spotting those bits and spotting which bits of your code are just the temporary throwaway bits of glue code um, and which bits are actually the, the bits that might be quite significant and go on to help you in other, or other people in other, um, in other projects in other areas. Um, and then you can focus on the more important ones. Of course, if you get a bug in either the important or the not important bits, it's just as bad. But. So, um, and occasionally if you do that, um, something might, nice might pop out. Um, like, I've personally found quite a few handy, maybe not world-changing, but sort of useful little features in the course of working on completely unrelated stuff. Um, like, some, there's some widely used juice classes like our variants and value trees. They just popped out, not from, not from me sitting down and trying to invent a data structure, but from going, I'm trying to solve this problem. Oh, well, this all kind of looks like a data structure, and then it kind of emerges, and they go, oh, that's quite nice. Um, let's, let's actually use that for other things as well. Now, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of doing too much of that. <clears throat> I'm very much an over-abstractor. Um, the reason we're all sitting here today is because I over-abstracted about uh, 10 years ago and turned a bunch of library code into juice. I mean, that worked out well. I'm a sample size of one. Um, and in most cases, over-abstraction is, is, turns out to be a waste of effort. But just enough abstraction um, is a good trait to have in, mod in moderation, at least. How do you optimize your number of runs? Well, that's tricky. I mean, it basically means getting your software onto an awful lot of devices. If you're a global mega corporation or a virus writer, then you've got your, you've got your tricks and, and ways of doing that. Um, but a lot of the really widely run code like Zlib came out of academia or open source. Um, so if you do create something interesting and it pops out and you think, well, that's quite nice, why not open source it? Give it a chance to spread its genes in the wild. How many, how many people does your code affect? How deeply? Um, and most of the tech industry is dedicated to fighting over that statistic, and I can't, I can't do better than them with advice. Um, but clearly, to have an impact on people's lives, what, what you write is going to have to serve some useful, or at least malicious, purpose. Um, if your mission is to make the world a better place by building Snapchat for cats, you're going to struggle with this score. Um, but you know, if by optimizing the um, the, the network band bandwidth for your cat pictures, you also uh, discover a way of optimizing dog pictures. At least you've kind of doubled your chances of it being not a complete waste of everybody's time. And the effects on your dependencies, um, you know, you need to think about how much value what you do adds to other software. Um, you know, if you're working on something like the LLVM optimizer, then that's quite an easy way to score points. Um, because downstream, that's going to have a huge impact on everything. <clears throat> if, um, if you're working on code that isn't public, then you're going to be limited to the effect that your code has on your colleagues and, and what they write and how happy they are. And, but at least you can try and make that a positive delta and not, not a negative one with those guys. Um, how do you reduce the amount of energy you use? Well, uh, evolutionary pressures should, in the long run, always do that for you. Um, but you can th and you can think laterally about how to lower your energy, like um, like VW did with their engine management software. Uh, a more traditional approach to lowering your energy is to just optimize your code. And there's sort of two levels at which you can you can think about that. You've got your your high level, your big O complexity score stuff, 
And the paybacks you get from worrying about this, this stuff uh, come when the scale is very big and uh, you know, the, the numbers and the numbers of machines and things get very, very large. And that's the blackboard level programming where the, I get the proper computer scientists love that stuff. Um, and then you've got your low level um, optimization which is all about understanding the language, understanding your target architecture and um, that's where most of us probably spend most of, most of our lives and that's what the com proper computer scientists uh, think is just beneath them. Um, but there's also a kind of middle ground um, that I think is very important as well. Um, again, I, I probably call it this canonicalizing level where it's about cleaning up your implementation so it's as lean and concise as possible, but without worrying about the big O stuff and kind of without worrying about the language <coughs> or the machine or even the language you're, you're writing it in. Um, and just getting that abstraction layer just right and getting it tight. Um, and that's the bit I've always actually enjoyed the most. So that's the bit I tend to bang on about the most in these kinds of talks. <clears throat> um, you know, if, if your ambition is to dominate the world that's particular uh, with a code that does a particular task, then you're going to have to worry about all this stuff. But um, in practical terms, um, a library that has, uh, unfortunately, a library that has great performance for, for normal data sets and bad performance for huge ones tends to, um, tends to win out because people, if that's what people generally need, um, even, if, um, yeah, even if it's big O isn't so great. So I know there's people in the audience who've written way more code that ma it matters way more than anything I've ever done, according to this definition or, or others. But this is, it's an interesting question to ask yourself. Um, it might not be your favorite or your best piece of work that's had the most impact out there. You know, like these musicians who have um, a huge novelty hit record and then spend the rest of their career regretting it and pretending, you know, trying to make people like their more serious later works instead. Um, for me, I, I, I think like the most frequently run stuff I've done is probably something boring, like the, the Juice 2D rendering engine, or um, like it's probably the edge table generator, or something really, really tedious like that. Pick the pixel compositing functions. Um, you know, and given how, the string class maybe, given how many times that stuff runs, because those, you know, that code I wrote must have run billions and billions and billions of times, it's amazing how you still find bugs in these things. Um, at, at the more interesting and bigger scale, um, there's classes I've written where uh, they kind of have more downstream effect, like the value tree class has been really helpful for speeding up um, development of a lot of projects. I've worked on other people's projects as well. So what is the most significant thing it's possible to write? Like, just sticking, first of all, to like our industry, the stuff we like, you know, could you invent an FFT algorithm that's like inherently faster than the current one? I, probably not possible. Um, but if you did, it would certainly be pop popular, and you know, we'd all like, love to hear about that. Um, maybe some of us can actually manage to replace MIDI at some point. Um, that would be awesome, uh, and a bit overdue. <coughs> um, can someone please create a file format library that rids us of that stomach churning horror that is FFmpeg? I mean, it's just not even got a good name. Um, you know, can someone invent a, a new effect that, that's even more catchy and annoying than auto-tune? Or a, a Stuxnet-style virus that attacks only computers that are running auto-tune? Um, <laughs> but pl please don't write another FM synth. We're good for FM synths now. The world has enough FM synths. Um, I actually have a secret, top secret project underway that I can't tell you about that I've designed to score very highly on all these scales. And hopefully that'll be my talk at next year's ADC. Apologies for the tease there, but I couldn't resist. But after that, um, that won't, you know, even that, it's not going to be the most important software ever written. Not quite. But what might be? Um, you know, if you went back to a more physics based definition of important, like how much will running this code cause the distribution of entropy in the universe to change or something like that, then, you know, what, what, what would that code be? You know, maybe someone in the room today is going to be the person who writes the neural net program that finally achieves post-human intelligence and like escapes and evolves and converts the planet and all of us into uh, raw material and fuel and then blasts off into space to spread its, um, its, its, its evil memes and conquer other, universe, other galaxies. That would be significant. Um, it's, uh, since the initial version of that would probably rewrite itself pretty quickly, it's not going to be around very long, so it's not going to have much longevity. So it's probably not going to have time to get more GitHub stars than node.js, 
or, or TensorFlow, unless it is TensorFlow. Um, but it, it might get out there and collect a few real stars on the way. So, rambling on, um, are there any vaguely useful self-help tips to take away as a TLDR from all this? Well, probably not, nothing very practical. But, um, you know, in your day-to-day -day coding, do, do get into the habit of keeping an eye open for that little, little nugget of great functionality that might just outlive the product you're working on. Um, and, it, you know, might stay useful for other things in the future. Um, you know, maybe it'll be something that helps someone else make a great medical discovery that buys you a bit of extra time when you're old and getting creaky. You know, or maybe it's something, maybe you're working on something that your grandkids will be using as part of the firmware of their hoverboards still in, in the future. You know, or maybe it'll be part of the laser weapons that your grandkids are firing at the robotic killing machines that during humanity's last ditch stand against this AI that's, that someone here is going to unleash with that, um, that uh, neural net algorithm they write tomorrow. Who knows? But you know, before civilization actually collapses completely, we're actually in a pretty lucky um, uh, industry because what we, you know, what we do does bring a sizable amount of uh, joy to an awful lot of people. <laughs> you know, if you work in finance and you create a more efficient hedge fund algorithm, you know, are your already rich clients going to get significantly more joy by being just a little bit richer? Um, you know, if you work in big data analytics, you might be able to measure exactly what people enjoy, um, but the biggest joy that your results are going to bring is that occasionally someone will get a targeted ad that offers them exactly the right kind of hose pipe that they didn't quite realize they wanted. Um, of course, if you work in healthcare or logistics or some essential services, then great, it's fantastic that you're doing something really valuable, but I bet it's really way more boring than what we do in audio and music. You know, we get to build these tools that we make musicians happy, and we help them create music that makes other people happy. Um, you know, it's a really, it's a really great, great problem for us to have to solve. And you know, we're, yeah, we're selling gadgets, um, but we're also kind of selling a dream. You know, if by building a seaboard, we can make someone feel, just even for a moment, that they look remotely as cool as Marco does, <laughs> then you know, we've done a good job. So that's my message. Thank you. <laughs>